Hello, everyone. Welcome to Alan Hu Foundation Mental Health Lecture Series. I am Chi Ching Hu, co-founder of Alan Hu Foundation and host for your webinar. Today, Dr. Pamela Morris Perez will present Adolescents Suicide Prevention 101, bringing the science to families, teachers, and the uh, pediatricians. First off, I want to thank Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities for providing simultaneous Chinese interpretation. And thank you, Ida Shaw, for Chinese interpretation. Alan Hu Foundation's mission is to promote mental health, raise awareness, and remove stigma surrounding psychiatric disorders, and support fundamental research for cures. Please consider making a gift to Alan Hu Foundation by scanning the QR code on the slide or using the donation link in the chat box. Thank you for supporting our programs to promote mental health. Today, it is our great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Pamela Morris Perez. Dr. Morris Perez is a professor of applied psychology at NYU Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, and affiliated professor at NYU School of Global Public Health. An interdisciplinary scholar, Dr. Morris Perez conducts research at the intersection of developmental psychology suicidology, education, and the policy. Her newest research born from the loss of her 17-year-old daughter to suicide in 2019 addresses adolescent suicide from a developmentally informed population health perspective for suicide prevention. She brings prevention to the spaces where youth are schools and emergency departments to help more youth connect to care more quickly. In this presentation, Dr. Morris Perez will offer an introductory understanding of adolescent suicide and prevention. The goal is to empower parents, teachers, and the pediatricians to have the knowledge to ask and to respond to adolescents' suicidal thinking mm -hmm. and to help more adolescents get the care they need more quickly in hope that doing so will save more lives. Following the presentation, it will be a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using Zoom Q&A function. The presentation is for educational purpose only and it is not intended for medical diagnosis. If you have any persistent symptoms, please seek professional help. With that, I'm going to turn to Dr. Morris Perez. Welcome yeah. Dr. Morris Perez. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you for hosting this. Um, I'm going to share my screen and play my slides. There we go, we can all see that, right? Yes. Um, perfect, thank you. Thank you again for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for all the work you're doing to uh, support mental health awareness and, um, and for bringing me here today. Um, Today, I'm gonna to be talking about adolescent suicide prevention. I wanna thank all of you who've decided to come here today. It is This is not an easy topic and you've made a hugely courageous first step just in coming to hear this talk. I wanna thank uh, Rachel Abnavoli at NYU, Stan Collins and Yana Shares Potosky at Directing Change, all colleagues who I work closely with who have really informed the work I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so I'm sure you've heard about uh, rising rates of anxiety and depression and suicidal thinking among our young people as a result of COVID-19. I'm sure you've heard about that in the news, especially this week. It wasn't COVID as uh, you heard that got me into this work. I was actually drawn into this work uh, before COVID from very personal experience. Um, my story actually begins um, 11 days after 9-11 when I was blessed with um, beautiful boy-girl twins. Uh, the two were perfect playmates for each other and compliments for one another. Uh, my son, the engineer, lanky and quiet. My daughter, Frankie, was the humanist, the pixie, with this sort of magical ability to connect with others. And the two would walk like this down the street. This is on our block. And I would walk behind them and just feel like the luckiest of parents. But that life was shattered when Frankie took her life, as you heard, at age 17. It was about three weeks before her high school graduation. Um, this was three and a half years ago, now back in June of 2019. 
As a parent, of course, I had a million questions after she left us, but as a prevention scientist, so I'm trained as a developmental psychologist that studies prevention programs, I those questions focused on how the world might look differently so another family wouldn't have to go through what we did. And so I began learning everything I could about adolescent suicide and suicide prevention. And the more I learned, the more I realized everybody needed to know for us to make progress together in prevention. But first in this new world, I was really confronted immediately with a new language. So I learned that suicidologists, that the people in the suicide community don't use the word committed suicide. And um, this picture shows the sort of wretched history of suicide and the reason why um, suicide for a, for a long time was criminalized and considered a sin. This is a picture of a church, I believe in England. The line you see on the grass is actually used to have a, a, a fence, a gate, uh, separating the gravestones of those people who died by all other causes, separating those uh, people who died by suicide. And while it's no longer a crime uh, and in many religions no longer a sin to attempt to take your own life, that history is actually not terribly far behind us. And so the language we use still sort of carries that forward. And it's why um, there's real encouragement to use the words died by suicide, just like you'd say uh, somebody died by cancer or died by heart attack. We say died by suicide. Um, I, I learned that someone like myself who's lost someone to suicide is a suicide loss survivor. Someone who is an attempt suicide um, can be called a suicide attempt survivor, just like um, Holocaust survivors. We've gone through sort of an emotional trauma and come through to the other side. And so it's really articulating that. Suicidology is the scientific field for the study of suicide. And suicidologists study three things. They study intervention programs. Those are programs for people who've already been deemed suicidal as a result of um, seeing a diagnosis by a mental health clinician. Prevention programs, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about a lot about today, uh, prevention of suicide. Um, and postvention, which is the supports for um, suicide loss survivors, where actually we need a lot more work. We know some guidelines, but we need um, uh, increasing number of programs for that. But that was really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what I learned uh, in term, uh, um, was the new language. I also learned that there was an exceptionally high prevalence of suicidal thinking among our young people, that um, one in five teens reports having seriously considered suicide in the last year. One in 10 teens have reported having attempted suicide in the last year. So this is a picture of a sort of very typical um, high school classroom. Uh, the um, uh, the, 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 that means like in a typical high school classroom, we might have five kids um, who um, are thinking about suicide, who've thought about suicide in the last year, two to three kids who've attempted suicide in the last year. Those numbers are, um, as you can see, very high. And what you might be saying is, well, of course, that's because COVID has really wrought so much harm on our young people. Actually, these data are from 2019. New data actually just came out this week. Um, it shows that those numbers are just slightly higher than that now. So it used to be a little below one in five kids. Now it's a little above one in five kids. Um, so that mental health crisis that you're hearing so much about in the news right now now, honestly, was very much around us pre-COVID. We just started paying attention uh, post-COVID. Um, I also learned uh, how much kids can camouflage their emotional pain, that it's not surprising to have a child like Frankie who can keep their suicidal thinking to them for an exceptionally long time. I also was surprised to learn how unpredictable suicide is based on risk factors. So a study was done back in 2017, looking at 50 years of research um, about risk factors and do they predict thoughts and behaviors around suicide? And it turns out that even though we've been doing this work for 50 years, we are no better at predicting suicide than flipping a coin. And that work hasn't gotten better over the last 50 years. Okay, so... Um, so in it, it was the combination of that, that very high prevalence that I told you about among young people and that lack of prediction among uh, uh, by researchers that argued to me that we should complement really important work that's going on in the mental health in the formal mental health system with programs in the spaces where kids already are in schools and emergency departments in pediatric offices and in homes. But it's very hard to prevent what we don't understand. And so one of the first questions I'm often asked when I talk about this topic is, what do you think causes suicide? And I could give you all the theory and all the research, but actually I'm gonna instead show you this picture, which is a game that some of you might recognize. Um, it's actually the game of Jenga. In Jenga, there's a tower of blocks 
Um, and uh, the object of the game is to not let the tower fall. You actually keep pulling out blocks one by one, everybody who's playing the game, until the last person pulls out the block and, block and the whole tower falls down, right? And so that person lost the game, right? Uh, but of course, it was all the blocks that led to that, that last one that really led to the tower falling. And in much the same way, um, suicide, which can be caused by mental illness, loss and trauma. Um, it, it's really the combination of all of these things. There are many, many causes of suicide from the biological, what we're born with and with the onslaughts we have over the course of our lives and environmental onslaughts and all of them in interaction, sort of a perfect storm that sort of together sort of contributes to suicidal thinking and behavior. Um, for many, the idea of suicide actually eludes us. How can somebody actually want to die? Well, doesn't that go against a sort of basic human instinct, will to live? And it turns out that suicide is actually not really about, or for many people, not about wanting to die. It's about wanting to end severe, unrelenting emotional pain. So just as we're hardwired to pull our hands away from a burning stove to avoid physical pain, we are simultaneously hardwired to avoid emotional pain as well. Um, uh, so, um, and, and suicide really is a reaction to that. So suicide can then be understood sort of as part and parcel of the human condition, as somebody in unrelenting, severe emotional pain, seeing no other way out of that pain. So our role then as those people who are around young people, right, as teachers and parents um, and, and doctors is to do what we can to relieve our teens emotional pain, to relieve that unrelenting emotional pain, right, to help teens find other ways for relief, sort of alternatives to suicide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then to find, help teens find their own reasons for living, particularly for the tasks that adolescents are actually developmentally supposed to be engaged with, that they're grappling with already. Questions about identity, who am I? And purpose, like what's my place here on this earth, right? And meaning, why is this a thing that I'm doing so important for who I am and, where, and, and, and what I'm doing here? And all of those things that we do can help reinforce that tower, reinforce that Jenga tower. Now, in trying to understand prevention, one of the first things I did, and I'm going to do this relatively quickly, was I looked to other stigmatized conditions because I think some of the lessons were instructive. And I remember I was walking down the street one day and I saw this big sign as it's in lower Manhattan. I live in New York City on Houston Street, Ralph Lorenz complain, uh, proclaiming their commitment to, um, uh, to uh, cancer research. They said, join us in our 20 year fight against cancer. And I thought, wow, how did um, cancer, how did the cancer movement move from a disease that in my parents' generation, people would whisper about it, right? She's got cancer, right? To become a, a disease where a private company would celebrate its 20 year commitment. And part of that happened, and I read Emperor of All Maladies, which told me some of this, part of that happened through articulating, really pointing out the language we were using around cancer and then later AIDS. Um, Susan Sontag wrote, writes wonderfully about all of this and the impact it has on all of us in the public and researchers too, about the ways in which we study diseases and think about disease. There's this wonderful quote in the book. She says, supporting the theory about the emotional causes of cancer is a growing body, a growing literature and body of research and scarcely a week passes without a new article announcing to some general public or other the scientific link between cancer and painful feelings, right? You'd be surprised, but this was actually in the late 70s, Johns Hopkins articles and others articulating a link between personality factors and depression and cancer because we didn't know what caused it. So we basically bundled it with all the other things we were scared of as well. So we really linked it to depression at the time and thought that that was a causal link. Okay, so we'd be surprised by that now, but that was then and um, really important. And then some of the ways we changed the conversation that we got Ralph Laurent to, to Ralph Loren to the table was through something called the Jimmy Fund, which is a radio program. I encourage you all to hear it. I don't have the uh, time to actually play it here, but essentially they took a kid, um, no last names. They just called him Jimmy, no last name, no prognosis as a kid who had cancer. They actually talked not about his cancer or his cancer treatment or the fact that he is really struggling. They talked about his love for the Boston Braves, a baseball team. They actually bring the entire team into his hospital room. They try to raise money for a TV. Um, basically, they say, we'll raise $20,000. If we raise $20,000, we can have a TV to watch the baseball game. And uh, they end up raising a couple hundred thousand dollars. And what they realize in doing that 
is the ways in which once you transform politically and publicly, sort of how do we think about disease and we bring hopeful messages to the table, people come to the table for, um, for prevention to really support it. I was reminded by autism and how parents were blamed as being refrigerator mothers until we really learned that there was an underlying neurobiological disease that was linked to um, uh, autism. Um, and suicide, I think, has come a long way. We are talking about it more. You were invited me here today. Um, but I don't think we're far enough. And I bring sort of as an example, an article that came out about a year ago now um, about um, the head of uh, NIH, the former head of NIH incel who wrote a book called Healing. Sort of it's a book where he really articulates the ways in which we haven't done enough yet for people with mental illness. But it was this quote at the end of the article that really struck me. He says, I want to ring the bell to tell people we can do so much better today. And there's no excuse for allowing people with these brain disorders to languish on our streets like this and die at age 55 eating out of trash bins. And I just want you to look at the language he's using to talking about people with mental illness, right? He's not talking about his brother or his sister, or his mother or his child or grandchild, right? He's describing it as somebody who's eating out of trash bins. And I think until we are talking about the Jimmy's and the Frankies and the Allens uh, of the world and talking about and sort of elevating hopeful stories as well about people who've attempted and made their way through, I don't think we can make progress in prevention. I look to models in other areas of work and I will get to suicide prevention in a second, but first I was really struck by some work that was done in the industrial accident literature. So a guy named James Reason wrote this wonderful set of things working with like nuclear power plants and other places and basically um, came up with this thing called the Swiss cheese model, which I think is a beautiful analogy about how do we think about really prevention of, of things that are really um, hard to predict and, and rare events. Um, and he basically said, we can't change the human condition. We can change the conditions under which humans work. And he talked about changing organizations by layering approaches to this sort of Swiss cheese approach. And so um, it's basically layering them in a place where we expect those risks, right? We actually set up our environments, assuming that those holes do exist, but the layers make a difference. And I started writing about all of this through a series of pieces that um, I entitled What Ifs. Um, these were named after the relentless thoughts that were plaguing my sort of every waking moment after we lost Frankie. The first one um, was really, what if we approach suicide prevention the way we do car accidents? It was renamed by an exceptionally wise editor, came out in the Times um, now um, uh, a couple of years ago. And basically I was struck in that, in, in writing that, about our history of seatbelt safety, that's very much where we are right now with suicide prevention. So back in the 80s when I was growing up, um, we were really worried about young, inexperienced drivers dying in car accidents, kids driving in car accidents. And the solution we had, we had seatbelts, but not that many people used them. It turns out only 15% of people back in the 80s used seatbelts. Um, and what we did was we created a system of protection where people could get trained in driver's ed, that those beeping sounds come on so that you uh, put on your seatbelt. You don't forget to put on your seatbelt every single day. Signs on the highway remind you, click it or ticket, right? Um, regularly to put on your seatbelt. And I started to think about how we could do the same thing in suicide prevention so that pediatricians and orthodontists and school personnel and parents and peers together can all understand how to recognize the signs, how to find the words to ask directly the question, are you thinking about suicide? And I'll talk about that in a little bit and connect kids to care and provide safety, okay? So it was really sort of this layered approach. So now directly back to suicide prevention, right? So a key part of suicide prevention are something that are called hot, uh, 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 hotlines or helplines or, or lifelines. So um, in this country, we have 988. Is actually one of uh, is actually the number now. It went from a ten digit number to a three digit number. But helplines actually exist all over the world in many many countries, and they are phone numbers that people can call to receive immediate emotional support. So you don't have to feel suicidal if you just need somebody to talk to because you're struggling emotionally. You can call this these helplines in many countries. Now with suicide prevention, they actually started with this uh, a gentleman named Chad Vera in 1952 in the UK. So um, he was sort of the impetus behind that. 17 years before, um, in 1935, he had officiated at the funeral of a young girl who had taken her life when she got her first period and she didn't know, she thought something was terribly wrong with her. She was 13 years old. She had no one to tell her it was a completely normal part of puberty. So he, after officiating over her funeral 
17 years later, he decides to invite, made a public announcement to asking those people who were suicidal to come and speak with him. And he was really good at what he did. So like it's crowded office all of the time. And eventually he had to hire some volunteers to sit with these people and I guess give them tea or other kinds of things to like sit with these people and wait with them while they were waiting to see him. One day he opens his door and realized that the crowd has largely dissipated. Um, and he's thinking, what happened? What magical thing just happened between my volunteers and these people? And that magic, it turned out, that helped that crisis abate, he came to call befriending and the people that did it befrienders. Um, and uh, I love, I wish all of our helplines were called befriender lines. I think more people would call them, in fact. But it's basically based on active listening, acceptance, understanding, and empathizing, but no giving advice and no counseling. And I tell you that full story for two reasons. One is that you know what helplines are. You're not so scared to call them. You're not so scared to share the numbers to really demystify them. And secondly, to demonstrate that if volunteers in an office working with Chad Vera, no training can actually ease pain, you can do this too. So what else works in suicide prevention? What works universally? And I'll get to some things you can do in a second. Well, it turns out accepting policies really matter. So wonderful work on same-sex marriage laws that when they passed in states, they actually reduced suicide risk among young people, particularly LGBT plus young people. Um, keeping people safe really matters, both at the population level, right, in neighborhoods, but also in your homes. I'm going to get back to the home one later. But in neighborhoods, if we build, if we put uh, barriers up in buildings or nettings up, it really matters. Firearm restrictions do matter, do work. Um, wonderful work in the UK for one at a time pill packaging, right? So less likely to take uh, lethal medications. Um, safety planning can make a difference. And I'm going to show you more about that in a little bit as well. Screening matters. Screening works. It turns out that if you screen in pediatric offices and in general emergency rooms, you can make a difference. Uh, in identifying kids who are suicidal, and it's not enough to just screen for depression. So a lot of pediatric offices screen for depression or anxiety. You miss about a quarter of kids or a little bit more uh, by only screening for um, other mental illnesses, but, but not asking directly about suicide. Turns out parents and youth see this as really acceptable. And there's really lovely like four item screening tools that you can use that are from the NIH. Um, Columbia also has a wonderful tool. And then after you screen somebody and they screen positive, you can actually link them to interventions that can make a difference. And one of the other pieces you can do is really good text and phone follow-up. So following up with a kid who's been in your office to say, hey, just following up, did you get connected to care? Just checking in, how are you feeling? That text and contacts can actually make a big difference, especially in the first few months after a child has had a suicide attempt. And then community-wide prevention can matter, right? There's a wonderful um, uh, uh, effort, something called the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act that gave money to communities to spend on suicide prevention in a variety of different ways. It turns out that made a difference to reducing suicide rates in those communities. Now we have, um, uh, that was a law that was passed um, in the Bush era. Now we have something called Stand Up that Biden uh, assigned into law. Wonderful, similar initiative, no money behind it yet. And so one thing you could all do is try to get more money behind the Stand Up initiative to really invest in communities and community suicide prevention. Schools. So I'm a developmental psychologist, but I do a lot of work in schools. So I really care about what's happening in school buildings. And it turns out that um, it's actually a very nascent field, uh, but there is some good things going on. So there are programs that try to train teachers to um, improve teacher knowledge about suicide. That helps. It does make teachers more aware of what's going on, maybe even able to ask the question and identify kids. It doesn't usually help kids know how to come to teachers directly. Okay, it doesn't help student help seeking. So kids are not asking for more help. We typically also haven't seen reductions in suicidal thoughts or behaviors because we don't study it, unfortunately. So really good first step, not enough. More importantly, are programs actually that are working directly with kids because it really matters to actually target things directly to kids. Kids are the first to often learn about suicidal thinking and their friends, especially for adolescents, not surprising, right? And so programs that target kids directly do seem to make a difference. There's several out there. I'm going to tell you specifically about one. Um, they, the ones that seem to work are really building on what we know as a, a, I as a developmentalist 
um, and people that are studying neurobiology of adolescents know make a difference for young people. Most importantly, they're really targeting peers, right? We all know, anybody who's worked with a young person knows how important their friends are to them, right? So really targeting that friend-to-friend relationship. Um, and we tend to focus as adults so much on the negative things kids are doing for each other, right? Peer pressure, right? Turns out kids are hugely important, positive influences as well. Wonderful studies of that around safe driving, peers set norms for each other, and they can set norms around talking about mental illness and seeking help from adults uh, as well. And that's some of the things these programs are really trying to change. Very quickly, I'm going to just show you something that we've also learned about the adolescent brain. So we used to think about the adolescent brain, this top figure is sort of a two-part system where the cognitive control system, the rational part of the brain was being outweighed by this really big red circle here, the social emotional system. So the idea was, oh, we need to like, you know, help downregulate all the emotions so that we could give more power to the rational side of their brain. Well, it turns out that actually adolescent brains might be three parts. They have the control system, the rational part. The amygdala is the social emotional system. So all those emotions are definitely there. But there's another part of the brain that might be more powerful than either one of those. And that's something called the approach system. And what that means is that essentially, and you all know this, adolescents like things that are a little bit risky, right? They like new experiences, right? And so it argues that we need, they need that for their brains, but we need to give them positive risky experiences to engage in so they don't engage in negative risky experiences, like getting up on stage or trying out for a team or you know, doing public speaking, right? Things that are a little bit scary, but that they can succeed at can really give them confidence in sort of building that out. And it turns out social rewards carry a particular weight. So when they have to do it for a friend, right, it carries a lot of salience for them. It's really important to them. So one of the things we try to do in some of our programs is help kids know how to break codes of silence and bring a kid to uh, an adult. Scary thing to do in terms of the relationship, really important sort of risk-taking behavior, different kind of risk-taking than we usually think about. Most importantly, as always, I was really inspired by Frankie's friend community. So um, Frankie is a very artsy kid, was um, spent a lot of time in her theater office. It was tucked behind the sixth floor of a large and bustling New York City high school. Um, and it's where she like had lunch and threw her backpack and snuggled in a pile of teenagers. Um, but it's also where she hid. There was a little corner of that office where she hid when she was struggling emotionally. And um, once uh, a girl that was a year younger than Frankie um, went there one day to cry. She was upset about something, overwhelmed by school or something about teen life. And she told us how Frankie had gone and just sat with her in that space. And just by sitting with her, Frankie had really helped sort of ease her pain. And so then the fall after Frankie left us, she, um, who was still in school, went and rebuilt that, rebuilt that corner. And she put post-its all over the wall with words like, it matters, you matter, and it gets better, and phone numbers to call for help. And so um, really changing it into a love vestibule, as she called it. Um, and so when I was looking for prevention programs, I really wanted those that would mirror what I saw in Frankie's friend community, a set of kids who could build a space with support and affirmation and healing. And that brought me to a program called Directing Change. So Directing Change is a suicide prevention program that's disguised as a film contest. This exists in California. Um, I, many of you are from California right now. This actually exists there right now. Any kid between the ages of 15 and 25 can actually submit, make a very short 30 or 60 second film in mental health awareness or suicide prevention, submit it to a statewide contest this year. The contest is almost closed, but there's they have a monthly art contest as well. Very clear rules about how to so make sure that the messages are safe. Um, the program's, oh, program's grown exponentially. And then a few years ago, the developers packaged it for schools. So rather than just a single kid working with a single teacher, a teacher would do it with an entire classroom of kids um, uh, in creating those films. And they submit them to all to the contest and they share them with their schools. And I'm gonna show you a film because I think it's the best way for you to learn what the program's all about. It's Alex. You know what to do. Hey bro, um, look, look, I'm just gonna be totally honest with you right now. Um, you know, I've noticed that you've been acting weird for a few weeks now and then you didn't show up to school today. Um, and, and I'm just starting to get really, 
worried about you. I gotta ask, are you thinking about suicide at all? I mean, I, I realize you can't answer that question because you're on the phone, but... Um, look, if you're listening to this right now, just please do a number. Just call that number before you, know, you make a decision. Look, you know, there are people here to help you go through this. Absolutely. Not in this alone. Yeah, I'm here for you too. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try your house and see if you're there. Okay, bye. Orange County Mental Health Crisis Line, my name is Chris. How can I help you today? Hi. Um. Kids are amazing, right? Very, very powerful films. Sort of take my breath away every time I see it. They are safe, they are positive, they are action-oriented films. These are kids speaking to other kids in the language that they speak, right? Not the adults trying to figure out how to speak to kids, but kids speaking to, film, to ki other kids. The films all look different because the kids come from different communities and different families. Um, and, they, um, and they are basically all trying to tell, basically teach their friends three things. How do you recognize the signs of suicide? How do you find the words to ask the direct question, are you thinking about suicide? And then connect your friend to care. In this case, they connect them to the 10 digit number that's now 988. What's really neat is in the school-based program that you could do it in lots of different ways in your classroom. So any teachers that are out there, they actually have, uh, you can do it in a video production class, right? You can make films, right? As part of PSAs. You can do it in a first year seminar for all freshmen or advisory periods. You could do it in an English class and talk about how you tell a story. Um, and in fact, they've got lesson plans online. They've got films online. So directingchange.org. All of this information, resources for schools, please check it out. If you're in California, I will say, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we'd love to involve you in the, in the program as well or connect you to um, our colleagues who are doing this work. Um, it's really cool because it has kind of a Swiss cheese model, right? So that kids are learning about suicide prevention through their filmmaking, but their friends are learning with them. Schools are, um, uh, we're affecting schools by advisors supporting the kids. Sometimes kids go home and work with their families on the films. Families are sometimes actors in these films. Um, it in involves the community as films are viewed and judged by members of the community. And then in fact, it affects the sort of larger environment as well as these kids are mentored to become the next generation of suicide prevention advocates. And so it's a program that starts with kids, but really goes through that full layer of Swiss cheese, right? And back reinforces the learning that these kids, they're not doing it alone. We actually spoke to some kids and I'm gonna do this very quickly. Um, of kids, students and advisors about the program. And these are some of the things they said to us. This kid said something like, well, yeah, I used to think that there were such narrow signs. He thought there were just a few things that mattered. But then I was doing more research and put more science into our film. And there was like a long list that I found. And I was like, wow, it's a lot more than I thought it was. And so just knowing all these things off the list is just making me more aware. And I'm checking on my friends more and making sure they're okay, you know. Um, I'll read this one also, because I think it's really important for teachers that are out there. This teacher says, I had a student who said, I'm really worried about this other student. Student, She's um, texting me about her plans to end her life. And I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this be correctly, because I feel like I have a responsibility to honor the trust she has with me, uh, with this private information. But I also know what we've talked about. As this teacher says, I know this case would have transpired differently. She says, number one, if we hadn't had those discussions where the student felt comfortable talking to me about it. So just by talking about it in your classrooms, you're opening the door for kids to come forward and ask for help. They need more spaces to talk about this. And also, of course, this child learned, if I'm your real friend, I have to get help for you. I can't keep this a secret. Okay. Um, Kids, I won't read all this because we don't have time, but they did realize they were less alone. They felt a lot safer going to other kids. And I will read this last one. Before it was kind of one of those uh, things where no one talks about it, but you know, like those go to the counselor, you know, um, like no one actively says like, hey, if you need help, I'm here. But after directing change, like I said, we ended up going through advisory periods and showing the film and talking about it. And everyone talked about it in a different way. It wasn't just like a, you know, quiet hush thing. No one was really scared to talk about it or like say big words like suicide anymore. So that was a lot. What can you do? I know that's mostly why you're here. That was a lot of background and a lot of other ways other people are starting to talk about it. 
So what can parents and teachers and providers do? You can know the warning signs. I'll talk about that. Ask directly the question, make a safety plan, reduce access to lethal means, connect these children who are struggling to professionals who are trained in suicide prevention and figure out how to do it in a not a traumatizing way. We do not need to throw every child who's having thoughts of suicide into inpatient. We need to think about how to do it in the least restrictive way so that we can keep them safe. So these are some of the warning signs, and I'll read some of these. There's a longer list on a parent brochure that Directing Change produces. That's what's on the right-hand side of the slide. Has your child lost interest in things? Are they having dramatic mood changes or changes in behavior? Have you noticed them getting more angry or irritable um, or agitated? Um, so sometimes it's not sadness. It actually comes out as anger or anxiousness instead. Are they engaging in risky behavior? Are they doing things that are a little riskier than they had done before? And they have they started to give their way some belongings? So um, some of these, maybe not the last one, but many of these are things that look kind of like just normal teenage stuff, right? And that's what's so tricky about this. And it's why I'll tell you in a second, like it's very hard to see the difference between normal teenage angst and suicidal thinking for, for many, many kids. Um, but there are some critical warning signs you do want to pay attention to. If any of these are present, you do want to call 988 or a mental health professional right away. Talking, if you have a child is talking or writing about death or suicide, if they're seeking methods for a suicide attempt, including searching online, and if they're talking about feeling hopeless, like they say, I don't know if it all matters anymore, or saying they have no reason to live, right? This is what these are the real, real clues that are very important that we want to move more quickly with, okay? Okay, so what do you do? You're seeing these signs. Now, what do you do? The first thing is to find a place to have a conversation. How do you start that conversation? Well, the first thing is to create the space for it, okay? It's not about having all the answers. It's not even having any answers, okay? It's about sitting with them in their emotional pain. Remember, they feel powerless. They're in emotional pain. Letting them share that pain with you, with someone else, can actually ease it. It's, it's like those volunteers, right? In that office, right? With Chad Vera, right? It's like letting an air out of a balloon. So David Brooks wrote um, this piece. It was back in December of 21. He says, Rabbi Elliot Kukla once described a woman with a brain injury who would sometimes fall to the floor. People around her would rush immediately get her back on her feet before she was quite ready. And she told Kukla, I think people rush to help me because they're so uncomfortable with seeing an adult lying on the floor. What I really need is someone to get down on the ground with me. And so that's what I tell parents when they have kids that are struggling and what to do. I tell them to get on the floor with your child who might be in emotional pain. And I know that's really hard because all you want to do as a parent or as a teacher or a doctor, right, is pick them up and help them. But I'm telling you not to. I'm telling you to actually sit with them in their emotional pain. Um, he ends his piece by saying, Kukla pointed out that getting on the floor can be anxiety producing. And when someone's in deep despair, even dangerous to the strongest caregiver, it takes a lot out of you emotionally. So that's sometimes you get on the floor. Sometimes if you can't get on the floor yourself, like it's too hard for you to do, you get somebody else to get on the floor with your kid. Okay. Um, I love this little cartoon here. It's a, it says, life is like a pot of tea, said Tiny Dragon. Sometimes it's too much for one person. Share it if you can, right? That's what we're trying to do, just share the pain around, right? These kids have held on to that suicidal thinking for a while. They need a place to share it. Okay. Now. How do you ask the direct question, right? This is the hard part. One of the biggest misconceptions about suicide, I'm sure you're all thinking this, well, wait, but kids are really suggestible. And so if I, if I ask them directly, aren't I gonna put the idea in a kid's head? And the answer is absolutely not. Talking about suicide does not increase suicidal behavior. In fact, by talking openly and directly, you're sending the message that you care and that you want to hear them, that you want to, you're actually done the hard work from them. They're scared to bring it up to you. I can guarantee that, right? By you asking the question first, you've done all the hard work. You've opened the door for the conversation. I call it sort of setting the table for the conversation. You've done the hard work and invited them up to the table. Now I'm going to spend another slide on this because I know it's always your question. Is it really okay to screen for and ask about suicide? So here's the research on it. So Maddie Gould, Columbia University professor, did a wonderful randomized trial, took a set of kids, randomized them. Half of the kids got a suicide screening tool, half got another screening tool, asked both of them about their suicidal thinking and behavior and found no difference between the two groups. 
And in fact, those kids who were struggling with depression the most, those kids actually had a reduction in depression. So they did see that easing of that emotional pain that I told you about. One of the reasons why I think this is the case is that um, for little kids, uh, so if you've ever walked into a, I used to spend a lot of time in preschool centers. So if you've ever walked into a preschool center, what do you often, often hear teachers say like, hey, Johnny, I see that you're really angry, right? Why do teach, preschool teachers do that? They do it because they are labeling emotions for kids, right? It works really well with two-year-olds and three-year-olds and four-year-olds. And we think that if kids can label those emotions, they can do a better job regulating those emotions. So this link between understanding or labeling and regulating it works for little kids. It also, I think, works for adolescents and, and it works for their suicidal thinking, right? So if we can label it for them, we can talk about it more, it helps them learn to regulate it better, okay? And I think the reason why we don't understand this is because of that wretched history I started this talk with, right, as a crime or a sin. Okay, so now I've convinced you it's okay to ask, but you're like thinking there's no way I could ask this question, right? So how do you ask? You actually ask directly. Okay, and the reason why you have to ask directly is that given suicide is so hard for researchers and clinicians to predict, the only way to really know if someone's thinking about suicide is to ask directly about it. Um, and if you can't do it, and especially if you've seen those warning signs, find somebody else who can. Okay, so how do you ask the question? Well, you can say, hey, I've noticed that, you know, like the kid in the video, I've noticed that you didn't come to school today. I noticed that you aren't going out with your friends as much. I noticed that you've been really antsy and I just have to ask, are you thinking about suicide? Or maybe you haven't seen any of that and you just wanna say, hey, I just heard a talk about how suicidal thinking is really much more common than I thought. And I just have to ask, are you thinking about suicide? And then once you ask the question, you need to stop talking immediately. I don't want you to immediately like take it back or say like, oh, I'm sure you don't feel that way, right? You don't want to shut down the conversation. You want to open the conversation. So you want to look like interested and open. Right? Uh, Stan Collins, who gives these talks, says you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen more than you speak. And if they say no, uh, you can say, okay, but just know that like I'm here if you if you ever do feel that way, or you know somebody else who is, if you ever do have those thoughts, it's really important to talk to an adult about it. Okay. And often that's the first conversation you have with everybody, right? Now, if they say yes, they say, actually, I'm really glad you asked. I do feel that. I don't want you to freak out. Thinking about suicide does not mean they need to be hospitalized immediately. And I want you to picture what you would do if your child came to you with a headache and you didn't know whether it was a headache because they needed glasses um, and they've been reading too much, they hadn't had enough water that day and they were dehydrated or you needed to bring them into the pediatrician to actually go eventually see a neurologist, right? You would ask a set of questions, even if you're not a doctor. I know pediatricians might be in the audience, but some of you were not, right? You would ask a set of questions and you would say, how much does it hurt, right? On a scale of one to 10. You would say, how long have you felt this way? When was the last time you felt this way? What happened right before you felt that way? Right. What were you doing? What and that and what happened to make it go away last time? And what you're doing in asking these questions is not only opening the door for them to tell you more about it, but you're also helping them learn the things that they're already doing that are working for them, right? That are helping distract them from those thoughts. They're taking those thoughts out of their head. And it's helping them articulate their, their coping mechanisms that are already very effective. I don't want you to, even though this is really scary and I know it's super scary, trust me, if you're scared to bring it up, your kid is really scared to bring it up with you, okay? Um, uh, I want to acknowledge that this is really scary. And the problem is, as I'm telling you, it's really scary and you are not allowed to do anything about it except to listen, okay? You know, when your kid, you know, was a toddler and they fell down and had a broken knee, you know, a, a cut knee, you could pick them up and hug them and put a bandaid on, you could do these things, right? And I'm telling you not to do any of that. Um, it's really hard to not fix your problem solve, but I don't want you to do that, okay? Really good language, though, that you can use. Um, so Stacey Friedenthal, wonderful uh, uh, clinician and suicide prevention uh, uh, advocate, um, has some wonderful language on her website called speakingofsuicide.com. She's got a blog that says the 10 things you can say to a suicidal person, like, I'm so glad you told me that you're thinking about suicide. 
you don't want to minimize. You don't want to say, but you have so much to live for, right? That's making them be like, well, but I don't feel that. That doesn't feel like what I'm feeling right now. You want to seek understanding what's going on that making you feel that way. Tell me more, invite conversation. And then you can say, I hope you'll keep talking to me about your depression or anxiety or thoughts of suicide. She has a wonderful new book out, Loving Someone with Suicidal Thoughts, great language in it. I encourage you all to buy it. Really good uh, book to have. You have to make safety a priority. So if somebody's thinking about suicide, um, if a child is thinking about suicide, and especially if they have a plan, if they are at imminent risk, that they have thoughts and a plan to act on it, you've got to work to keep them safe. Okay, it's really important. And that means understanding what is their preferred method um, for um, taking their life, but also taking out those things from their environments that they can hurt themselves with. And so that includes uh, weapons, firearms in particular, that they can hurt themselves with. Um, you want to securely store medications. So there are lock boxes that are available at um, local pharmacies. Um, uh, uh, you want to put away both your um, over-the-counter medication like Tylenol, but also um, prescription drugs that you might have gotten for a procedure and never finished that are sitting in your medicine cabinet. And this is just the way we would do is we're baby-proofing our homes, right? We did all of those things when our kids were babies, right? You want to do all of those same things now for all teens and particularly for suicidal teens. You can also create something called a safety plan. So Barbara Stanley, wonderful Columbia professor, developed something called the Stanley Brown Safety Plan. And there's an app you can download. It looks like this on your phone. You can walk your kid through it. Your mental health professional should be doing it too. Talks about the things that activate the kid, the things they're already doing that are helping distract them, the people they can go to when they're in crisis. Um, and it really helps them articulate a bunch of those kinds of things. It's a great sort of talking tool and you wanna keep revisiting it with them on a regular basis. And then your child can also download a wellness app. So Virtual Hope Box allows them to articulate some things that are hopeful to them. So they can access that when they're feeling without that hope. Um, a wonderful app called Not Okay where they can identify a few people. It was made by a brother, sister pair, identify a few people that they can ask for help, press a button and immediately be those people will be notified, hey, please check on me, I need some help. Um, and then most importantly, a child is having thoughts of suicide, especially if they're having a plan, needs to be evaluated by a mental health professional and somebody with training in suicide prevention, okay? Just like if you were, if your child had cancer, they'd see an oncologist, not just your pediatrician in the same way, not all mental health professionals have training in suicide prevention. You can call a local crisis center, a mental health professional, your family doctor, and you do want to reach them as soon as possible, especially if your child's at risk. You can always reach out to the crisis lifeline or the text line right away. And then finally, please take care of yourself. Take a deep breath. Like just like they say on the airports, right? In the airlines, right? Put the mask on yourself before you put it on the person next to you. This stuff is hard and you are a better parent and a better provider and a better teacher when you're calm and you have your own support system in place. There are lots of resources out there for help. 988 is more than just a suicide line. You can actually call if you're worried about somebody too. So if you're worried about your kid, you can call and ask for help. They'll put you on hold longer, but they, but they will give you information. Trevor Project has a wonderful set of lines, chat, uh, uh, phone, and um, text for LGBT plus kids in particular. Wonderful website called suicideispreventable.org and Stacey Freedom, Freedom Falls book. Um, very quickly, I'm going to end because I know we're just about out of time. This talk is part of a larger center that I named called Arcadia for Suicide Prevention. And I call it that after Frankie, of course. Um, it was a, a play that Frankie read in her senior year called um, Arcadia by Tom Stoppard. Number of themes that I won't go into if, that are really relevant to a lot of work in suicide prevention, but I'm going to mention one, which is its title, uh, which comes from this painting, uh, which actually um, uh, uh, alludes to, it's actually a picture of a country scene, Arcadia, but a tombstone in the middle of it. And the notion is that even in the context of beauty and tranquility, there is tragedy. And I think just like that, we need to acknowledge that suicide is among us. And um, by doing that, by that acknowledgement, I think we can make a difference in suicide prevention. And I'm gonna end uh, with, of course, the post-its and, uh, and uh, Frankie's friends. So I think sometimes we feel like our words and actions are as flimsy as these post-its on the wall. They're carefully chosen. I gave you some language, but way too few. And especially when we think about all these onslaughts that are really impinging on our kids' success and their healing and, their, um, and, and moving forward. 
last fall, uh, uh, a year ago fall, a student that was only a freshman when Frankie was a senior asked if they could redo that corner because of course with COVID actually all the posters had come off the walls um, and this time more permanently. And she made it into, they made it into this, which is um, something called the, the love saloon instead now, um, complete with an affirmation station where you can articulate around your uh, mental health um, and things that help you. Um, and so I guess my final message to all of you um, is to start your kids healing with these simple words and a space to listen, like the love vestibule, um, like Frankie did with her friend in that space. And while it might feel like our words are as flimsy as those little post-its against all of the things that are happening in this world, trust me that others are going to be really inspired by you and your modeling and your example of doing it. You're going to tell people about it. You're going to say how hard that was, but they'll join you in doing that. And I think if enough people do this, uh, set the table for those conversations, give more spaces for kids to have those open and honest conversation about what's really scaring them. I think it's going to be, um, we're going to create a world that's as sturdy as this love saloon in my daughter's school. So with that, I am going to end and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris Perez for the wonderful talk. Yeah, um, so uh, let's open up to q and a. Is this okay to say I think we need to get some help? Is it okay to say you need to you, you need to get need some to help get some help? Is this okay? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that a um you can if you're talking to a child and they are wondering, uh, uh, you know, and you feel like you can't do it all yourself, you can say, hey, I'm here with you. I'm gonna, we're gonna figure this out together. We're gonna get more help together to really help you move forward and help you through this. It is not something that you need to say, I'm gonna do it all myself and all alone, absolutely. But I think it's also about saying that you're gonna listen to it and be there by your child's side, be their rock, right? While they're going through it as well. Right. Are there cultural considerations to take into account when talking directly about suicide? Are there cultural considerations? Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that different cultures speak differently about emotions, um, about uh, mental illness, and about um, suicidal thinking, um, uh, the barriers to um to uh, approaching uh, mental health treatment can be different across cultural groups. So absolutely, I do think there's some commonalities as well, right? In the base, we're all human as well. And um, asking the question directly is not sort of, doesn't need to be culturally specific, but yes, our approaches can, can vary by culture. And it really is important to sort of recognize those differences and be open to them um, uh, as well. Okay. So if someone has received a treatment and no longer considers suicide, how do I tell if a suicidal ideation returns and what should I do if it does? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. So one of the things we know about suicide is that it's not uh, linear, right? So sometimes uh, somebody may feel suicidal um, thinking for a period of time. It may go up and down over a period of time. It actually could be higher one time of day and lower another, another time of day, right? Some people feel it constantly. Some people feel, feel it fleetingly as well. And yes, sometimes it can be relieved by therapeutic services, right? Like therapy. And sometimes it, it relieves on its own through other aspects, other coping mechanisms. I think you still want to look for those same warning signs, the same kinds of things that I was speaking about before. So it doesn't change the way we'd still look for those, even if it's sort of returning. And again, you want to just continue to open up the conversation and say, hey, like, I'm so glad you're feeling better. And if those thoughts ever return, I really hope that you'll come back to me and talk to me again about, about that suicidal thinking. Mm -hmm. How to get someone to see a provider when they are resistant, even with a depression? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the hardest things, right? So mm -hmm. like it's, it's you know, uh, we all think that providers have, you know, is a really important part of the answer. Um, uh, but, you know, sometimes um, kids don't want to go see a provider. Um, and in part because, right, don't forget, you know, seeing it, it's, it's really different. I mean, one thing I think you should explain to a child or to a youth is the ways in which a, a therapist is a really different adult in their life 
than their parent or teacher. Most adults in their life tell them what to do, right? A therapist does not tell a child what to do. A therapist helps the child learn what they want to do. And so the first thing I would do is sort of talk through that with your child or with this child to really help help them understand the different role a therapist plays than a parent or a teacher, okay? The second thing is, is in the end, you can be like, hey, can we just try out one? And if you hate it, then we'll try another one. Like it has to be a match between the child and the therapist. So it's also okay to be like, can we just try one and see if that works? You know, I, you know, it's all about trying to help them feel better in the end. And then the, and you can't force a kid to go, right? It really does have to be their choice in the end. Right. So, but it is about listening and understanding and asking them what are the things that are making them scared to go. One thing that might be they're really scared of is actually getting ending up in an inpatient unit. Right. They don't want to talk to a therapist because they're afraid they really honest with them, they're going to get locked up or get something taken away from them. And so the trick is to really help the therapist is there to really ease their emotional pain and really help them to start to understand that. But you've got to together find a therapist that actually they they can trust as well. Is there some medication that helps with the suicidal ideation? So suicide is co-occurring with other mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, PTSD, a number of others. And so many of the same medications that we do for those illnesses are also used for suicidal thinking as well, um, but they don't work for everybody. So yes, uh, there are medications that are out there um, that can help. What they mostly do is they, you know, some of the medications, for example, lift the depression. Again, I'm not a clinician, so I'm describing what I understand from these. And you really should talk to a psychiatrist to explain these distinctions. Um, but in general, yes, there are medications out there. They sometimes lift the depression enough that actually somebody can start working on the suicidal thinking part of this, right? They don't necessarily get rid of the suicidal thinking. They actually help you do the behaviors that help reduce the suicidal thinking itself. Okay. So what more can parents do once they have listened and emphasized? Oh, uh, what can they do? Um, I mean, so most important is literally just to listen. I can guarantee you like a lot of just the sitting and listening and understanding and asking more questions about it is just going to give a kid more space to talk about it. Okay. That is the most important thing. You want to do it in places where it's easy to have those conversations. So that could be in your living room, but maybe it's actually, you want to go for a walk with your child because then you don't have to be eye to eye and actually kids might actually say more or they're in the backseat of your car while you're driving, right? You don't want to have distractions, right? You don't want to have your phone with you, but you do want it. Sometimes spaces like walking is a really good one because you're like, you're moving your body, right? And sometimes kids reveal a lot more when they're like out with you walking. So honestly, talking is a huge part of this, right? Um, it's really about opening the door to continue. And, and it's not a one-time thing, right? It's continuing to open the door. How are you feeling today? What's going on? And then it's slowly but surely helping your kid engage in the kinds of things that give them back their sense of identity and purpose, right? Which could be, you know, like, you know, um, doing something as an after school program in a school building or, you know, or the work that or the school work they're engaged with, like, what are the things that actually fill them up, right? Spending time with friends, what are the things that help, help, you know, sort of give them back that sense of hope uh, in the end and purpose in life. Um, and so it's really about sort of helping them find those kinds of activities that'll, that'll really be healing and helpful to them. Okay. And should a child who has a suicidal ideation leave school until they are feeling better? So this is a super complicated question, actually. And so I, you know, actually have a good example of this. So, um, I, you know, it really depends on the kid, um, as I will say. Like, so for some kids, being in school might be the thing that's the source of their um, suicidal ideation. They're getting bullied in school. They're they're struggling in school in terms of academics. So it actually, it's a place that they're not healing in. For other kids, school can be such a great distraction, right? So don't forget. So the way I think about suicidal thinking is like, imagine your kid is um, walking down the street one day and they see a penny on the sidewalk and they pick it up and put it in their pocket. And all day long, we've told them, you can't tell anybody that that penny is in your pocket, right? 
what would that kid be thinking about all day long? They'd be thinking about that penny in your pocket, right? So part of this is literally like by having kids talk about it, it's not going to perseverate in their heads quite so much. But the other thing is, it's really talk to your kid about whether school is a place that helps, like it's it's distracting, so it's going to be really helpful, or it's a place that actually is, like I said, a source of their pain. I remember I spoke to a family once who's um, child had been um, uh, in inpatient and um, was getting released from inpatient. And uh, the family said, the kid wants to go straight back to school. And I can't believe they want to do that. I've taken time off work. Um, this is this doesn't make any sense at all. And I said, you know, I wonder if the kid doesn't want to be alone with their thoughts, right? So if you stay home, then you're alone with your thoughts and they just keep perseverating your head. Maybe the school is a really good distraction right now. And um, and I think that helped, right? Them to see that. So it's really, it depends on the kid um, is the way I would describe it. And talk to your kid about whether they feel like that's helping them or not uh, in terms of their suicidal thinking. All right, uh, next question. Is there more suicidal ideation, especially among adolescents than there used to be? Um, so yes, the rates have gone up slightly over the last uh, 10 years. So suicide ideation, uh, so thinking about suicide and suicidal behaviors have increased sort of slowly um, since 2011. So since, uh, over the last 10, 12 years. Um, I do also think um, that we've been talking about it more. So, so I think two things have happened. Yes, I think kids are thinking about it more now than they were 10 years ago. I will say actually rates were really high in the 90s. They came way down and then they've been slowly climbing since the early, um, since 2011. Um, so, so if you look back 30 years, we've actually had higher rates in the 90s. Um, but we are talking about it a lot more. So I do think kids are more open about it. I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, and yes, I do think there is a modest rise as well um, in suicidal thinking. Mm, okay. Uh, how can parents handle their own stress and while living with someone who may attempt to suicide at any moment? Yeah. So this is the scariest thing, right? So like, you know, listen, um, I'm not going to minimize this. I think for a parent, knowing that your child um, might take their life, is like the scariest thing for a parent to hear, right? Um, and um, I think the best way to take care of that is two things. Learn as much as you can, you know, read these books that really help that you feel like are speaking to you, that are giving you the kind of advice that resonates with you and your family, okay? That feel like they're they're respecting you as a family, um, like Stacey Friedenthal's work and others, that feel like they're arming you with the right information, ultimately. Do what you can to keep your kids safe. And then you got to take care of yourself. You got to do all the kinds of things that are stress relieving yourself. You know, find a friend to talk to regularly, go for long walks, you know, all of these things to take care of yourself. Because like I said, you're a better parent when you are calmer um, and, and, uh, and when you can sort of manage that level of stress. It is, it is very, very stressful. I, I will say one other thing about this, which is that for most kids, um, and, and not everybody, but for many kids, kids who have a preferred method of taking their life, if you keep them away from that method, um, that typically can keep them safe. Um, so it doesn't work for everybody, but it does work for many kids. So, you know, you don't want to sort of have your mind racing about like, well, there's 20,000 ways that they could do something to hurt themselves. Most kids, like I said, have a preferred way. And that if you can stop sort of access to that preferred way, whether it's taking pills or what have you, um, uh, it really does reduce the risk of suicide for that child. Okay. When a child is hiding their depression behind a smile, how can a parent tell? Yeah. So this is the thing. So some of it's hiding. And, I, and so two things I want to say. So part of it is kids hide and can hide. Sometimes also when a kid is with you or with their friends, they're not as depressed, right? So because this is highly volatile, a kid could feel okay one minute and then the next minute not feel okay, right? So it does change over time. So some of it's hiding. That's what I was talking about, the camouflaging. And some of it's just, it's highly variable. So like at night, 
maybe when the kid's not with you or not with their friends, that they're feeling more suicidal. So that's exactly why I say you've got to ask the question and you've got to be open about it, right? So I say in our family now, because we are incredibly open about it after we lost Frankie, it means that other kids or friends of ours um, talk about suicidal thinking with us really openly. And I will say that's a really good thing because we are sort of a safe place to talk about it now. Um, we need more people that are comfortable talking about it sort of all over the place. Um, uh, and I think it's okay to talk about it, you know, with your friends and colleagues too, about like, hey, my kid's struggling, you know, what are you doing, right? And sharing that information. I remember once I was, um, uh, after I came back to work, after we lost Frankie, somebody had left me a card in my office um, that said, hey, um, my kid struggled with depression for two years in bed. And I came to work every single day and I didn't tell a single person about it. Um, and then, you know, the pit in my stomach every day and then went home and did what I had to do to try to see if I could you know, help my kid. And I don't know what happened, but my kid got better and it was nothing really that I had done. But the piece that struck me the most about that letter was that she hadn't told anybody about it. Maybe because she was embarrassed, maybe because she felt like someone would judge her as a parent. Um, maybe they judge her kid. Uh, rather than sort of getting the support she needed. So I just, like I said, I think the more we talk about this as a society, the more we're all going to support each other. Um, when you look at cancer survivors, right, one of the things you get is like people who are struggling with cancer support other people who are struggling with cancer. Like we need more of that in the suicide, in mental illness and in suicide prevention as well. Okay, um, what are things we can do for our adolescent children to trust us when they are in pain? Yeah, I, I think you have to be trustworthy. You know what I mean? I think we want to open the door to the conversation. Kids, you know, listen, I, I also want to say something that like, it may not be an issue of trust. It may be because they're protecting you. I remember hearing once from a kid who said, that they had struggled with suicidal thinking and they hadn't told their parents, they had a great relationship with their parents. They said, I didn't wanna worry them, right? So sometimes the not telling you is not because they don't trust you, it's because they love you, um, because they care deeply about you and they don't wanna make you worry. Um, they know there's a lot on your plate. So I think it's also about just showing that you can handle it, I think can make a really big difference too. Um, and then, like I said, not freaking out when they, if they do tell you that they're struggling or their friend is struggling, um, it, chances are your kid knows somebody who's struggling if, if they're not struggling themselves. A certain diagnosis more likely to result in suicide? So anxiety and depression are um, sort of the two that like, uh, you know, at the top of the list for sure. Um, but there's a bunch of others as well. Like I said, PTSD, um, uh, other um, uh, similar uh, uh, diagnoses are are related to suicidal thinking. Um, so um, so those are there. I think what worries me actually is that we everybody assumes it's only depression. So we're like, oh, well, if my kid's getting up and going to school, then they and they're not depressed, right? They're not clinically depressed, right? Multiple days of lying around and not being able to get up then they must not be suicidal. And I think that's that's the challenge, right? That's not the case. Um, so that there, there are kids who struggle with suicidal thinking that are not depressed. There's also some who are suicidal thinking and no other underlying, as far as we know, mental illnesses. And so that's sort of super complicated and hard for us to all understand sometimes, um, but that can be the case. You can be suicidal. Like suicidal is just thinking about thinking about death and wanting to die, right? Severe emotional pain doesn't have to sort of reach the clinical diagnosis for depression or anxiety or or, or another um, mental illness. Okay. If I ask directly about suicidal ideation, how often is too often? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a delicate balance, I am sure, right? You don't want to be asking every day, like, hi, you suicidal, hi, you suicidal, right? That would be too much uh, for sure. Um, I think it's, like I said, is you don't want to just ask once and then never ask again, like, oh my God, I'm glad we got that over with and we're never going to ask it again, right? It's much the same way you have all of those hard conversations with your kids, right? About, you know, 
about sex and about drugs and about alcohol, right? You repeatedly have those conversations over dinner, when you talk about drinking in moderation or whatever, however you talk about it as a family, however you feel comfortable talking about it. Those are conversations you want to continue to come back to. Again, not every day, but on a sort of regular cadence so that it feels like it's at something open that you can just, you know, you can bring up, you know, on a sort of, uh, yeah, regular basis. Um, so you just don't, it's not like, you know, it's not a one, it's not, it's not only once and it's not once a year, um, but it is about opening the door to the conversation. And certainly if you see changes in the child's behavior. Can you develop PTSD from having a friend who died by suicide? Um, so, uh, so having a friend who died by suicide, I'm actually going to broaden the question. So I, I, like I said, I'm not clinically trained. PTSD can be an outgrowth of um, having a friend who died by suicide. It can also be an outgrowth of other trauma. Um, I will say having a friend that died by suicide, it can be especially challenging. Um, uh, uh, suicide um, is, a is a very complicated loss, right? Um, so um, your family knows this, my family knows this very well. It, it pairs the grief of loss with shame and guilt and responsibility and all of these other things that sort of layer on anger sometimes for some people, layer on other emotions that are really hard to get through. And all of that can sort of challenge even the strongest person. Um, so often people who um, know people who died by suicide can struggle with all kinds of mental illnesses um, uh, and struggle with suicidal thinking themselves. The people that are most, the friends that are most at risk are two groups. When we worry about kids, we worry about the friends that are closest to the child who died. And then we worry about the kids that are farther away, but are struggling with their own mental illnesses before this happened, right? So those are the two groups you want to check on the most after a suicide loss um, are the kids, like I said, the close friends, and then these other kids that had underlying mental illnesses. But honestly, like everybody's affected by a suicide loss. And that's why we need more, what I was calling at the beginning, um, postvention programs um, as well. Those, those supports for people after a loss. We know very little about how to do that in schools. We know what not to do. Uh, and we have guidelines for that, but we don't know really how to support kids in sort of healing um, and grieving. Um, actually, I will provide another resource for those people who have experienced a loss or know a child who has. There's a wonderful group called the Dougie Center. They have they work in child grief um, uh, out in Portland. They are amazing. They have all these resources, a uh, 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 podcast called Grief Out Loud books and resources for kids who are struggling with grief, not just to suicide, but to other losses as well. Wonderful, wonderful group. Right. Uh, thank you for sharing that information. Uh, next question. How do you tell if a suicidal threat is a real or manipulation? Yeah, great question. So this is what we often worry about, right? Is that people are like, well, are you just being manipulated? So a, um, uh, First of all, I will say that um, there's a wonderful chapter on this in that Stacey Friedenthal book um, about um, is, it, is it manipulation? It might feel like manipulation to you. It may not be intentionally manipulation to the person that's doing it. So I just want to sort of say that. Um, I think you need to take every suicidal uh, threat, so to speak, seriously. You need to treat it as if it is um true suffering that somebody is going through and treat it as that and not sort of minimize it by assuming that it is a sort of a, a particularly manipulative piece. Um, I will say that sometimes we feel manipulated by it. And like I said, there's really good language um, in Stacey Friedenthal's book and an entire chapter on this topic. And I sort of really refer you to that as well. Um, but in general, suicidal um, reporting suicidal thoughts is not a manipulative behavior. I think in general, we think that it is about people really are struggling and in a huge amount of emotional pain, um, which really, you know, uh, and we really need to address that. Right. Um, Dr. Morris, for us, we, we have another five minutes go. Um, to go, we have uh, many questions. Uh, should okay. we continue? Yes, I am fine continuing. Okay. No problem. Right. Thank no you problem. so much for staying no so long with us. Not at all. Not at all. It's an important topic. 
Okay, so next question is, do teachers have something to do beyond what parents do? Uh, yeah, I think teachers are really important. So, you know, listen, sometimes kids don't want to, like the last person they want to tell is their parent, right? Because those are the people they see every day. Like I said, sometimes they're worried most about them. Um, uh, there's lots of reasons why they may not tell a parent first. Um, teachers are hugely important. You see kids so often in the school day. You see the kids in a different environment. You see them interacting with friends, right? And other peers. So you can see things and changes in behavior that a parent may not see at home. Um, and so I think teachers are very important uh, adults. Uh, around kids that can a keep an eye out for things but sort of again open the door to the conversation it's why I shared those stories those quotes from those teachers I think they were really really important sometimes teachers can then connect the child to care in the school building to a counselor to um uh to and you know and contact the parent about uh, on behalf of the kid um, but, but yeah, really, really important sort of other adults that care for kids. What kids really need is to know that adult, the adults around them care and are willing to sort of, you know, check in on them on a regular basis. And that's what teachers can really be really important to do. Okay. So is it okay to talk with the fifth and the sixth graders about suicide prevention? Uh, will it give them negative uh, psychological effects? Not at all, actually. So it turns out that kids start understanding the concept of death and suicide actually as early as age like 10, 11. So it's actually, in my opinion, never too early to start talking about this. Um, I will say it's, you know, you want to do it developmentally appropriately. So, right. So like different kinds of questions or ways to talk about it may come up. But in fact, some of the things we're really worried about are very young kids who are um, also have suicidal thinking. It is more rare when you're younger but it is not, um, but, but some kids do have suicidal thinking, even at very young ages. There's wonderful programs actually for younger kids, it's something called the Hope Squad, where kids learn in middle schools how to actually just like go to a kid who's like sitting by themselves at a lunch table and like be the Hope Squad, right? And go over and just like sit with them and just like make them feel less alone. So it, it, it's it's a different kind of program, um, different ways to do it um, than you do in a high school effort, but, um, but certainly um, really important and very important to talk about emotions more generally um, with that age group and how to learn how to regulate those emotions as well. All right, great. How do we find out about what the preferred method is? Yeah, good question. So what you want to do is um, so that's so that um, uh, what you want to do is when you're talking to your child, you can say, you know, it was that question, like, right, are you thinking about suicide? And then you can say, you know, are you, do you have a, a way that you have thought about taking your life? Um, and if they say yes, you can say, okay, do you want to tell me about that way? Um, they might describe that way. Maybe it's a way they've looked up online. Maybe it's a way that they've heard about um, through other means. And so that's, or maybe they've attempted before and, you know, they've, you know, um, and they, and they can tell you about that. So you want to ask those kinds of questions and then see whether you can sort of reduce the access to that way of, of, um, of taking their life. Um, and it's why, like I said, I think actually most families should be locking, should be teen proofing their homes, right? Given that we so don't know much about this. Okay. So any difference between how you help adults compared to adolescents? Hmm, great question. Yeah. So one of the weird things is actually the field is very, what I would call a developmental. Actually, we don't typically differentiate a lot of things uh, for adults and for kids. Um, many of the adult programs actually are ones that actually just have sort of been moved down to younger kids. I will say that like, it's partly why I talk so much about involving friends, because I really think that friends play such a, and peers play such an important role for adolescents. So that's a really important piece of the, of the adolescent puzzle, uh, for sure. Um, uh, and then there's also this sort of notion of, we think developmentally, right? Kids are trying to develop sort of their own sense of control, right? 
and um, and their sense of, like I said, their identity. They're trying to figure out who they are. And so sometimes, right, you really want to sort of think about those kinds of issues that would be coming to the fore for an adolescent as different than they would be for an adult who might um, be struggling with different kinds of issues and sense of responsibility and, and responsibility for families, for example, and other kinds of things, right? So this is about how do we um, approach kids, but it's really about just, you know, the same kinds of things we do normally in terms of parenting teens. Okay, um, we're at about time. Can we have a one more questions? And ask course. question. Sure. What takeaways sure. would you want us to have? What takeaways? I guess I would like to say, um, don't be scared of this. It is, I get that it's scary. Um, open up the conversation as much as you can. Open it up with not just your child, but your child's friends. Um, and, um, and that it's, that, it, like I said, it's okay to ask about it and it's okay to sort of recognize that this sort of part and parcel of, of, um, ad, of many adolescents experience. And so the more we're talking about it, the more we can continue to sort of build, build those supports and build those protections for our kids in everywhere they're already are in their homes and schools and doctor's offices, et cetera. So um, but also just thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk about this as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris Perez, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Yeah, no A problem. Presentation and the Q&A. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if anybody has questions after, they're welcome to email me, uh, Pamela.Morris at NYU.edu. Feel free to reach out. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining our webinar. And we hope to see you again on April 19th for a webinar with Dr. Jamie Young on the topic about interpersonal psych psychotherapy adolescent skills training. Uh, please take a moment to fill out a short survey. I will leave the donation QR code for a few more minutes. And thank you for donating to support our program. Uh, with that, I'm closing the webinar right now. Thank you. Goodbye. Take care and stay well.